Alrighty, here we go. All right, so uh, sorry in advance for a couple of things. One, uh, the short notice on this live stream. Um, and also, uh, I, I just got this yesterday and I am so excited. Uh, and also, it is very hot in Providence. So uh, uh, apologies for the uh, general, uh, hello, good morning. Uh, Apologies for the uh, the short notice and also the um, general uh, lack of <laughs> vintage clothing today. It is very hot in Providence right now. So, um, but I so I go to a lot of <laughs> vintage and antique stores in Providence on the weekends just to sort of like um, just to see what they've got. And also, I love vintage clothing, so I, I go like shopping and stuff. And I actually got. Uh, this lovely little number yesterday also, uh, which isn't this the cutest thing you've ever seen? Like, oh my gosh, look at these little feathers. But um, that's not what we're here for. I was talking with, uh, so her name is Ren. Uh, she's with Nostalgia Antiques and Collectibles in Providence. If um, any of you guys uh, who are watching now or watching sometime in the future ever come to Providence, they are fantastic. They are uh, uh, the vendor, the different vendors there are very knowledgeable in their, um, the things that they have and their, uh, uh, the prices are very reasonable as well. One of the things that definitely kept me from, um, from starting out dressing vintage is because it's so expensive and they've really, uh, they really help out with that sort of a thing. But, so I was talking with Ren, um, who is... Uh, one of the owners there, as it turns out, and about hats and <laughs> all that sort of stuff. And uh, she mentioned that she had an Edwardian hat, like an actually Edwardian hat. And I asked to see it and she let me see it and it's gorgeous. Uh, and <laughs> in extremely good condition, given that this hat is either almost or over a hundred years old. Um, and I, uh, the other day, I, well, yesterday I went back and I, um, I asked her, well, so I, uh, we sort of got to talking and I, um, I said something to the effect of, oh boy, you know, that hat is gorgeous. I'd really love to, um, it's, it's a, such a shame that it's in the condition that it's in. Uh, I would love to be able to try to recreate this hat because it's amazing and it's not in the kind of condition where anybody could really wear it. Um, and so uh, one thing led to another and she let me borrow it for two weeks. <laughs> So I'm going to attempt over the next two weeks to um, to try to recreate this hat, and I am so excited. I, there are a couple of really great uh, hat making tutorials on YouTube. Um, uh, the woman who does them is called Angela Clayton. Uh, she also makes uh, historical costumes, and she uh, hand makes the hats to go with the costumes, and they're beautiful and gorgeous. So. Uh, both shout out and shameless plug to her because yeah um, and also uh, yeah so this is gonna be interesting I personally have never made a hat before so this is, this is gonna be cool <laughs> yeah so I um when I saw the hat uh, that was about a month and a half ago um, uh, or when I first saw it anyway uh, so I thought I would do a little stream uh, where you sort of take it out of its um, sort of carrying bag here and uh, start to make the uh, like the initial um, measurements for it and uh, talk a little bit about what kind of materials I might be using and that sort of a thing. So yeah, uh, yeah, and I am going to have to prop up my computer. Hang on one second. Is this book gonna prop it up? There we go. Okay. There we go. Oh, please, computer, please don't fall over. All right. Oh, yeah. And this tape measurement. Um, 
kind of flexible, uh, generally used by tailors, but there is no way that I'm going to be able to get a straight, uh, a straight ruler around the band of the hat. So, yep. And oh boy, I should have thought this through a little before I started. Uh, here's another one. Okay. That's it, that's it, that's all. Oh man, I just, oh, oh there it is. Okay. All right. That notebook and the pencil, the tape. I'm gonna put these over here for now. All right. So. Uh, Okay. Oh man, there's oh there's feathers on top of this. Okay. Alright, so hello. Alright, um for those of you who uh, just came in, there uh, I had the incredible luck to get my hands on an actually Edwardian hat at uh, an antique store at, in Providence, and with the um, uh, I was allowed to borrow it for two weeks with the intention of attempting to recreate it uh, to try to make one that looks like this one. Uh, um, because this really isn't in the kind of condition where you would, or anyone really would actually be able to wear this. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, this, okay, okay, it isn't tilted down quite enough, so I'm going to have to very carefully. Oh gosh, what? Ah, it's so sunny outside. All right, I don't know how well you can see this, but it's, um, I'm going to put this down because it's coming apart in my hands. Oh my gosh. Uh, yes, it, <laughs> wow. Okay, I'm a little afraid to touch it now. Uh, <laughs> a bit of the brim came off on my wrist now. It's just like, oh. um, so it's uh, the crown. I, all right, I'm gonna try to, uh, okay, there's, uh, oh boy. Oh boy. All right, there's, there we go. Wow, that's really an awkward angle. Okay, yeah, so the, and my hair is getting in the way. Oh man. All right, all right, all right, all right. Sorry for this, guys. Um, all right, okay. So, there we go, that's better. All right, so the top of this, the crown of this hat is covered in I believe ostrich feathers, uh, which were quite common um, for Edwardian hats. And this material uh, that the hat itself is made out of seems to be a velvet of some kind. Um, I probably am not going to be using actual velvet in my uh, reconstruction um, because that would be kind of expensive, but uh, it's kind of fold it up on both sides here, although I don't know whether it, that's actually like a design feature or whether it's, um, that's just because it had to be kind of uh, folded up to fit in the bag that I got it in. Um, okay, let's see. I'm going to try to take a look at the inside of the crown here without it coming apart. Please don't come apart. Oh. <laughs> All right. Oh. Wait. Wait. Oh my god, you guys. All right, so there is no way that I'm going to be able to, yeah, <laughs> there is no way that I'm going to be able to really show you what's uh what's inside here but there it's um uh the the crown is lined in 
probably a silk of some kind and it's um it has like a, a drawstring sort of around it uh I, if i'm not mistaken the um the no well, i should probably be propping this up a little bit um uh the crowns of yeah yeah i know it's eh. all right uh well hang on a second. let's just flip this guy back over and try doing it like this as oh, oh boy oh boy okay that's a little better um and i'm just gonna try my best to hold it up then <laughs> Yeah, this uh, this whole thing was um, is very much a uh, uh, last minute sort of a thing. I only got this yesterday, and I'm really excited. <laughs> yeah, so on the inside of this, okay, all right. This uh, the the crown of this hat sort of comes up a little, and I think. That may, I think it's supposed to do that um, because I, uh, there is, oh, I just flipped this over. Yeah, there's a drawstring in the middle of here. Yeah, this thing is huge. Uh, it's, how big is this hat? Um, it's definitely over a foot from end to end. Got my uh, measuring tape here. Yeah, uh, 17 inches. 17 and a half, maybe. Um, and there's uh, there's wire, you can, uh, there's wire that I can tell is sewn into the brim. So it's possible that it could have been uh, even larger, um, but it just over time has deteriorated. Um, but so the crown of this hat kind of comes up a little. And I, think that may have been a design feature instead of like a, a deterioration over time um, because there's, uh, oh, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, <laughs> there's a drawstring in the, um, so the, uh, it's definitely a Wardian. Um, let's see. I'd put it at about, Anywhere between 1906 and 1912, somewhere around then, um, I am going to uh, double check with Ren, the actual owner of this hat, um, who is the owner of uh, Nostalgia Antiques and Collectibles in Providence, uh, who I got this this lovely lady from. Um, <laughs> don't know why I'm betting it. <laughs> it's just so soft, um, but. Uh, yeah, and uh, so the crown of this hat seems to be lined in silk um, or something something of that sort, but right, right in the very top of this hat is a patch that reads Lord and Taylor, 5th Avenue, Broadway, and 20th Street, New York, Paris. Um, which makes me really excited uh, and which means this thing is so old. I don't, I mean, it's, the brim was coming apart in my hands. I don't think I should probably uh, try it on. Um, it's just, it's just so old. Uh, but I, um, that Fifth Avenue Broadway label makes me really excited because Sonia Green worked at a Fifth Avenue department store when uh, she was, uh, when she was before and when she was married to H.P. Lovecraft. So I am going to have to do a lot of research <laughs> on where exactly she worked. Uh, it's probably in, in census records, but, um, Oh boy, wouldn't it just be a trip if this hat was from the, the same store that she worked at? Like, oh my God. Uh, oh man. Oh gosh, yeah. Yeah, so this, um, the crown 
uh, I believe this is ostrich feathers, either dye black or just black ostrich feathers. I'm not sure whether they come in black. <laughs> and the brim itself, uh, the majority of the hat seems to be made out of velvet of some kind. Um, I'm gonna go back to tilting this down so that you can kind of, oh boy. Yeah, I, uh, I actually used to work at a county archives before I moved out to Providence. And I, um, I, I blame and or give credit to that for my research in space. Um, let's, let's see. Oh, that's not going to work. Okay. Um, all right. Ignore the takeout in the background. Uh, okay. All right. Yeah. So this ostrich feather, you can kind of see, and then the velvet, oh, you can see it a little better from this side over here. Oh. Given that it's probably over a hundred years old, this is held up extremely well. I'm really kind of surprised. I'm like, like kudos to them. They, they don't know how to make them last. Uh, there's, uh, you can kind of see there's a wire into the brim here. Which makes me think that uh, that possibly where this hat is folded up over here and over here. And oh gosh, my arm is starting to ache. Okay, uh, one sec, guys. I'm gonna grab my chair and try to put it on there. There's a camera in me. Uh. Yay, live. Okay. Oh, that's gonna be too low. Uh. Crockpot, more like a camera holder. Oh, wait! By the end of this year? Oh man! If they aren't closed already. Oh boy, wouldn't that be so cool to like actually go on? Oh man, oh man, you're giving me ideas. Cause uh, Providence is about a three hour-ish drive from New York City. So I could, I could totally do that. Oh my God. <laughs> there we go, that's a lot better. Okay, so let's get that out of here. Uh, and actually, actually I'm gonna, Get that tissue paper out of here too. Okay. All right. Okay, so I'm try to turn this around. From how this uh, from how the sides are curled up, I think if all right, so they aren't curled evenly. This side is a little more curled than this side. So I think it may have originally been a flat brim and it's just been curled to, uh, to fit in inside various hat boxes and things. Um, but, actually, this is a really good angle. Um, uh, if it was supposed to be curled like this, then this side is, would most likely be the front um, because it's, uh, uh, oh gosh, this is really kind of awful. How do you put this anyway? Um, okay. You see how it's, uh, this side being the front. Uh, okay. Like, oh, shoot. And it's got enough power. Okay. We're good. We're good. Let's go around a little more. Oh, okay. All right. So, this side be in the front. Uh, you see how how it's curled on this side and on this side. Oh boy. Oh boy. All right. That's well, gonna have to improvise here again. Um, okay. Okay, well, 
You know what? You know what? I'm just going to try to describe it, and it's probably going to be bad, but I'll take pictures, and I'll post them <laughs> somewhere. I'll, I'll definitely post them on my Twitter, but I will uh, try to do this here. So with the top edge being the front, you see how it's um, how this side, this bottom side, there's oh, uh, there's less of this side and more of this one. It, so like if it was sitting on my head, it would be um, there'd be more here and then less toward the back, like kind of tapered toward the back. Uh, so now of course. That that wasn't the style, the typical style of Edwardian hats of the time period. Um, generally, they had a flat brim and were um, uh, had the crown, the big crown, and then had a flat brim all the way around. Um, that said, I am not quite an expert on Edwardian hats. So uh, there could have been a couple that had this sort of, um, uh, kind of like a cavalier almost shape. Um, I'll, uh, again, I'll put up photos on my Twitter uh, to try to sort of explain a little better what I'm saying. But in the, um, uh, during the English Civil War, it was between the Roundheads uh, and the Cavaliers. The Cavaliers had a hat that sort of curled up on one side and was flat the other way around. So this could be um, uh, trying to emulate that sort of a style. Uh, it could also possibly not and just have been curled over time, but um, I am going to follow up with Ren, uh, the original owner of this hat, and, or, well, not the original, original owner, but the, the person who I'm borrowing this from, <laughs> and uh, see what she has to say about that. Yeah, musketeer style. Yeah, so that, um, actually, come to think that the Three Musketeers was fairly popular during the Edwardian time, so that could have, that could be a thing. That could be a thing. <laughs> Again, research, but. Yes, so I am going to um, start making uh, measurements and sketches of this uh, because I only uh, am being allowed to borrow it for two weeks. Uh, and so I want to make sure that, I think I should, I should hopefully have it done in two weeks, but if I don't, I want to be able to um, to have references to go back on. Uh, I'm actually going to come over here. So, uh, if you guys have any um, any particular questions about uh, what I've been getting up to lately, or the hat itself, or um, what I'm uh, trying to measure at any given time, then go ahead and uh, put it in the comment section, or the other uh, little chat thingy and I will uh, try to get back to you. I, uh, work has been, um, it's been kind of slow. Uh, I work for a, uh, a pool company in Massachusetts and it's, um, there hasn't been a whole lot for me to do, <laughs> but I, uh, I've been told that it's supposed to get busy again fairly soon. So, mm. but yeah, I got, oh, I, um, I got a new uh, a new dress yesterday, which I want to finish this up first um, because I know if I stop and switch uh, change gears, I'm going to forget something. But it's this gorgeous sort of 
jade emerald sort of green 1950s sort of number and it's oh it's gorgeous uh, <laughs> Oh man, oh, that's a really great, that's a really great, uh, that's a great question, Jeff. Thank you so much. Right, so I have done, <laughs> I have done a lot. I'm actually going to move this so I, I can sit down on a chair instead of uh, kneeling on the ground. <laughs> um, I have actually done uh, quite a lot, as it turns out, uh, more than I thought I would do re uh, research on hats of the early 20th century. <laughs> and it, they, oh boy, did they change. Oh man, it, there have been so many, just so much differences, even between the, um, I'm moving my uh, power cord over there so I can have the computer on the table while still being charging. Um, there we go. So the style of hats in the 1900s was very much um, very reminiscent of uh, oh, that's there we go um, of hats in the 1890s uh, which were generally um, big uh, with a really really big crown or uh, um, generally they had some sort of like, like this with the ostrich feathers or, uh, or some kind of, um, uh, feathers and fur were very common for that time period. There were, um, oh gosh, there, I saw this one hat that had almost an entire dead bird on it, <laughs> which the hat was gorgeous, but like, it's just, you, you see it and you're like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> um, and then uh, in the, so between the 1890s, yeah, it was very Titanic. Uh, the 1890s right through to the, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, My Fair Lady is supposed to uh, be from that, that sort of, that section of time, the Edwardian period. Um, Queen Victoria died in 1902, and her son, I believe, Edward, uh, took the throne. Um, and the Edwardian period is generally between uh, the, um, uh, it's 1901, thank you, yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, I, uh, but yes, and um, uh, the Edwardian period like you say, uh, 1901 to 1910, although uh, depending really on which historian you ask, it can um, extend out right up until the start of the First World War, um, where at least in terms of fashion, uh, things um, between 1910 and 1914, it, it didn't really change a whole lot. Um, the, apart from the general silhouette of women's clothing, um, in the Edwardian proper times, um, the uh, women's dresses had a very, um, they were called an S-bend shape to them. Uh, so the top of the S being a woman's bust and then down around with her waist and then up into um, a sort of almost a bustle uh, in the back. Yeah, it, oh, they were gorgeous, gorgeous dresses. Um, probably not the most comfortable to wear because of that S-bend shape. Uh, corsetry was still very much in, uh, in the Edwardian period. And even right through, um, uh, if up through the, uh, during the time of the First World War, things were relaxing a little bit, but not as much generally as, say, the time between the 1890s and the early 1900s. Um, and then uh, the war ended, and uh, things, uh, fashion-wise, started to relax a lot more. And 
Yeah, rationing. Um, cloth was rationed because they had to make soldiers' uniforms. Uh, and actually, or no, it isn't. Um, <laughs> uh, they had to make soldiers' uniforms and also uh, airplanes of that time were the biplane sort of construction. So they had uh, cloth, generally canvas, um, covering the wings of the planes and they uh, and parachutes and things like that. Um, uh, and that also, exactly, yeah, and that um, rationing would also take, uh, um, that would impact uh, the thing that was pretty significantly during World War II as well. Um, uh, but yes, and uh, then uh, the 20s hit and uh, things had been, yeah, they, uh, they they loved all their buttons and the epaulets and the, the just the, the cords going down and oh gosh I saw a uh, a picture of a British uniform in, um from World War One that had like a a belt going from one shoulder all the way down across the uh, across the torso um, for no I'm not entirely sure why. <laughs> Uh, but they did become a lot more utilitarian uh, towards the end of the world, uh, the war, not the world. Oh my gosh! <laughs> but yeah, and then um, after the war, things were starting to uh, relax a little. Um, the corsetry lost fat. Uh, it it wasn't as fashionable to. Exactly. Uh, corsetry wasn't as popular as it had been. Um, and personally, I think uh, that has a little bit to do with the influenza epidemic of 1917. Um, because if you have influenza or tuberculosis or uh, just that sort of... No, it was 1917. No, it was 1917. I could have sworn it was 1917, but yeah, the, the influenza epidemic anyway. Um, it, uh, I am just going off the top of my head for this, so apologies uh, for any inconsistencies. Uh, yeah, Spanish flu. Um, that, I mean, if you are very, very sick, uh, having a wasp waste is not a priority. Um, and that uh, it was people transitioned, or people, women transitioned from having proper corsets. Yeah, uh, my great grandmother as well um, transitioned from having proper corsets to having, uh, uh, they more resembled like waist trainers now, where instead of, um, Instead of going over the bust as well, it just focused on like the midsection. Um, and there were much less, uh, the silhouettes were much more um, sort of natural. Yeah, you'd, you'd think that'd be common sense, wouldn't you? <laughs> but hey, <sighs> ah, well. But yeah, and uh, then the 20s hit and, um, while certain people did still wear these sort of more um, more waist trainer-ish corsets, uh, there were so the um, the image of the ideal woman had changed very significantly from the uh, the Edwardian period uh, through to the war uh, World War One, and then like between that and the 1920s. Exactly, yeah, the uh, the 20s um, sort of body ideal was uh, rather short, very rectangular, kind of um, not exactly squat, but very sort of solidly built, I guess you could say. Um, it, uh, women, instead of trying to, um, trying to uh, enhance their bust, started um, uh, the early bras of the time period um, actually resemble sort of what I'm wearing now. Uh, just triangles. Um, it was originally made uh, exactly. Uh, it was made of um, 
originally had two handkerchiefs that had been uh, folded in half and sewn at the back. Um, and so that, that and underwear were like, that was the only undergarment that women in the 20s generally wore. And that is such a change from the, uh, the corsets and the, um, and the, the under slips and the, uh, the petticoats and the everything to sort of fill out these dresses that they wore. Uh, women in the 20s did still wear slips um, because some of them, uh, some of the 1920s dresses were uh, kind of see-through, um, but it really depended on the person who was wearing it and also uh, the particular dress, which year it was, you know, uh, what the occasion was even, that sort of a thing. Um, and notice I say the 1920s dress, not the flapper dress. Uh, oh boy, I, yeah, it, mm -hmm. <laughs> there is a reason that I, so I like wearing vintage clothing, but I do not think I would ever wear uh, a vintage outfit um, from a time period that, or vintage inspired anyway, outfit from a time period before the 1920s because of all those um the hoop skirts and the the petticoats and the everything and it's just it gets hot <laughs> oh, even in the 1950s when petticoats came back in they um hmm mm -mm. <laughs> not for me there are some people out there that really um that pull it off very well but uh, that is not going to be me. <laughs> and then the, um, uh, so the, the 1920s were very much a backlash. Well, so actually, actually going to the bathroom was uh, much more of a different sort of affair in the Civil War period than it was, uh, than it uh, ended up being later on in the, um, even in the decade, but later on in time, because of the hoop skirts, um, because they uh, their underwear had was split down the crotch, so it um, it was uh, you basically just picked a spot outside and you squatted down and did your business and you know sort of lifted your skirt so that it wouldn't trail in it. But you know there you go, and then uh, later on, I mean it. Not to say that, yep, yep, yep. Yeah, I, I don't think I could ever wear a coat in the summer. Well, but I say that having, I was wearing a jean jacket yesterday, but I mean, it was kind of, not exactly chilly, but it was in the 60s yesterday. And now for some reason, it's back in the 90s. And I'm like, Get it together, weather. But yeah, yeah. It, I mean, to each his own. It, you do you. It's not for me, but you do you. Uh, and I, um, and it was. Uh, I mean, it must have. It, it had to have like been. It, it probably has a lot to do with the fabric that was used, and uh, like you say, the color and um, just that sort of a thing, what the lining was made out of, of the coat. Uh, because people, it, up until like the, uh, really the 60s, um, these uh, coats were pretty much kind of mandatory for going outside. Um, in the last 20 years, things have changed. Uh, I mean, I myself personally, I remember wearing uh, bell-bottom jeans as a kid, which I would probably not wear now. God, I love those things though. They had a paisley print and everything. I was, I love those things. I wore them until they fell apart. Uh, but it, um, it, uh, nowadays women's fashion can be kind of split between um, the after the 2010, 2012 sort of period and before then. Um, the early 2000s were uh, a lot different. Um, 
just speaking for myself personally, uh, in, oh gosh, um, there, uh, why is my, this is my life. Why is my mind blanking on my, oh my God. <laughs> I blame the heat. Yeah. It, well, I mean, fashion is a cycle. It's a, it, things keep coming back. Like in the, in the 1960s, 1920s, sort of drop weight style dresses were back in fashion. Um, and in the, uh, and in the 80s, uh, sort of more 1930s, 1940s dresses started popping, or 1930s, 1940s style dresses started popping up. Uh, and I actually have, um, actually, actually, this, uh, this particular dress that I have, uh, that, it, this is from the 90s. Um, but you see it has that drop waist. This is uh, down to about here on it. So that's very much a drop waist style. Um, so fashions do keep coming back. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's very much a 90s pattern. It, it, there are... I can't really think of another decade where you'd have a sort of graphic print like this, um, but I love it. I love the color and it's great. Actually, while I'm at it, while I'm at it, this is the new dress. It still has a tag on it, but what? And it's sort of, and this sort of front part is attached on the side, so it just sort of looks like you have like a a fancy coat over top, but it is, it's like, it's all the dress and it's so cool. I love it. <laughs> oh yeah. And this is kind of, this is silk too. Oh, okay. Now that I think of it, uh, I have, this particular dress, which is um, and very much has a 1920 silhouette, it's a maxi dress, so it's a whole lot longer than they would have been. But they keep coming around. It, this sort of like very straight, not a whole lot of um, of structure to it. This was uh, if this dress didn't uh, didn't reach the ground, if it didn't trail the ground, and this could. I mean, not the print, but the silhouette of this dress could pass for a 1920s dress. And that's um, I, the first couple of outfits that I had that were um, uh, kind of sort of halfway vintage uh, were sort of halfway vintage because I got them in modern stores and because fashion keeps coming around, they had that sort of that old sort of style look. Yeah, it... Wait, which one? The uh, the the new one, the green one, or this, or the uh, I probably will do a video on like cyclical fashion at some point. I'm gonna quick put this away. Yeah, I really love that dress. <laughs> that I think. It, it's starting to, to kind of show its age, too. I got that, oh boy, four or five years ago. And I think um, when, it's, when it's really on its last legs, I may uh, try to use it as a pattern to make, uh, to make one that looks just like it because I really, really like how it, um, how it looks when it's on me and all that. Uh, but it's just <laughs> time. Uh, the... the, the the terrible trifecta of uh, of non creativeness, time, money, and a sewing machine. <laughs> or at least that seems to be my terrible trifecta. <laughs> yeah, but so well, um, well. Oh man, I want to so bad. <laughs> I'd have to get myself a sewing machine, but. Oh God, yeah, I know. Oh, I know how you feel. 
I, uh, when I was in high school, I did, um, I was the yearbook photographer and I, uh, their, the school's camera was really good. And so I asked my parents if I could have a camera for my graduation present and they got a camera, which is, uh, it, I mean, it's, it's very nice. Um, but it wasn't as nice as the one I was used to. And I was just kind of like, oh, thanks, guys. <laughs> I was terrible at receiving gifts back then. <laughs> oh, gosh, that would be fantastic. I, oh, man, I used to have a sewing machine when I was, um, gosh, when I was in about fifth or sixth grade. So that would be, uh, ugh. 10, 12 for, um, for any, uh, non-U.S. people. Um, but I, I actually, this blanket back here uh, that I have all my pins on was one of my first sewing projects. I did it for the county fair. Um, it really, it doesn't have to be fancy. That's the thing. It, because the, uh, sewing machines can get really expensive. Um, and, uh, the, uh, the really, really expensive ones can be, um, they can be very, uh, like you can embroider with them, you can make patches, you can do all sorts of like fantastic things, but that makes them like, uh, upwards of a thousand dollars, which is a bit much. <laughs> um, uh, actually, while we're on the subject of money, I do have a Patreon, uh, which I will, yeah, uh, <laughs> I have a Patreon and a, a Ko-fi page, um, which I will, uh, link at some point where after I've reattached the computer, uh, the keyboard onto my computer, <laughs> um, but I, uh, yeah, you can get them secondhand, um, but then, yep, I still have the PayPal. Uh, it, again, links will all end up in the description box of this video uh, after all of this ends. Um, I'm actually just gonna, or gotta put this guy back on. <laughs> I have one of those computers that's actually a tablet, but it works really well. Oh yeah, no, I, I totally understand. I have been there until very recently I was there. So it is all good. Um, let's go on now. Work, 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 work. Oh boy, I think I screwed it up. Okay. No. All right. Yeah. I'm going to be doing that later, <laughs> but yeah, it's, um, <sighs> oh, I think I think, I haven't been there to double check, but I think there may be a, um, a place in Providence where I could, uh, where I could possibly, um, like rent a machine. Uh, there's a place called the Whipstitch Cafe, which I think if what I've read about it is right, is a place where you can go in and like, uh, have, um, uh, uh, rent time on a sewing, a particular sewing machine and do your, yeah, it, that's what it sounds like anyway. I haven't actually been there. Um, I read about it when I first came to Providence and I, uh, when I first got here, I wasn't really in a position where I could, um, I had the, the time or frankly the money to, uh, to go to a sewing cafe, <laughs> but I, um, I do now, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try, uh, and then of course, if there isn't, then I'm, I may try to, uh, go on eBay and see if I can't find one there, but, hey, you know, and then, I mean, I have dropped a couple of hints to my mom for Christmas presents, but, uh, who knows, <laughs> Who knows whether that's actually going to work or not. It didn't work the last time I tried asking her for something, so hey. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but when, um, 
Oh, really? If, uh, all right, I, I am going to put my email in the chat. And if you can send me a link to that, that would be fantastic. Oh my God, no, why is this not working? Uh, come on, computer, do your job. Please work. Here's the mouse. There you go, there you go, there you go. Oh gosh. Oh, come on, where's, there it is, haha. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, all right, it, that is my email address. If you can send me a link to that machine, that would be fantastic because that is actually in my budget too. So that would be really cool. <laughs> Yeah, and I, um, yeah, so the uh, 1920s fashions were very much uh, a backlash from uh, the Edwardian fashions and the fashions before it. Um, there were, uh, and then later on, um, 1930s fashions were a backlash from the 1940s, or uh, from the 1920s, I mean. Um, the 1930s were all about sort of a return to femininity. Uh, they had, um, in the 1920s, uh, hemlines got a lot shorter, and they weren't as short as flapper dresses, um, which even then, flapper dresses would have been, uh, like, they would have gone to, like, just above the knee. And that for, like, the most daring. Um, the majority of 1920s dresses were uh, hit about uh, mid shin, mid calf, um, and they, uh, uh, which that was still um, a big change from the floor length dresses of the time before that, um, or dresses where the most you could see of a woman's leg were. Um, was the top of their foot or oh god for, god forbid the ankle oh you know <sighs> the stories were wild i swear to god but um uh, in the 1930s hemlines dropped more and they were um uh they went back down to uh really quite close to the uh, quite close to the ground um ankle length or a little bit above the ankle uh, the um, they had much more of a fitted waist. Uh, a lot of 1930s dresses. Oh, I've seen some gorgeous 1930s dresses that have these like big ruffly, uh, ruffly sort of. It looks almost like a cape, but sort of sleeves, uh, short sleeves that oh, they're gorgeous, um, and which really didn't. They were pretty uniquely 1930s sort of design elements um and then uh and even for i mean not just for the uh not just for uh the movie stars and the glamorous fashion for the normal people um who i mean the 1930s was the great depression people were down their luck they didn't have a whole lot of money for uh, for cloth to make their own clothes and I mean because clothes didn't come off the rack then um, and the uh, the um, so a, a sort of trend popped up where people um, would have uh, chickens or rabbits or um, in some cases I think ducks in their backyard uh, they would raise them uh, to eat and the uh, the animal feed came in sacks that have um, oh uh, uh, the uh, yeah things did get practical they um, but the feed sacks uh, they had they were printed on the inside um, so people used they would buy a particular brand of um, this particular brand of animal feed and then they could turn the sacks inside out and use the fabric of the feed sacks for the dresses um 
And oh man, I th- there is one of those dresses in uh, a vintage store downtown in Providence, but it's like sixty dollars, and I I can't justify make it spending sixty dollars on one particular dress. But oh, it's gorgeous, and I just oh, I had a bit of an existential crisis when I saw it yesterday. <laughs> um, as for Amazon Prime, I don't have it, but I would be willing to pay shipping for that. Um, I, oh my gosh, mom, why do you keep texting me? Are you okay? Yeah, mom, I'm fine. I told you I was fine yesterday. What are you doing? (laughs) (sighs) Hang on a sec, guys, I gotta. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they were. Uh, I, um, Jeffrey, if you can uh, give me your email address or um, or if you can get a hold of me on Twitter or something like that, then we can exchange information because I would, um, that sounds very, uh, uh, that sounds like something I'd be very interested in. Um, and Sayer is a really good brand too. Uh, but I, um, uh, I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. If I mean, I've given you my email address, so we can uh, get in touch that way. But yeah, that. Oh boy, I'm getting excited now, guys. <laughs> um. But yeah, and there are some, um, there are actually some really neat colorized photos. Of, uh, in the 1930s, there was this particular uh, photographer who went around um, in where the, uh, the sort of uh, south-southwest area where the Dust Bowl was happening. And he took all these photographs of just average people, how the average person was holding up in uh, such a trying time period. And there are people online who have colorized those photos and they're just equal parts heartbreaking and gorgeous. Oh man. And like, and especially for me, because that was my grandparents. My my grandmother um, was born uh, towards the end of the thirties. And it's just really sort of, it really sort of helps um, hammer home that like it well oh boy how do I put this so from what I've sort of noticed history tends to um people tend to get like sort of removed from history uh they there's a it's easy to say like oh well that happened so so far ago like why does that 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 doesn't have any impact on things that happen now. Like, just stop. No, no. The past should stay in the past, and then this is the present. So let's just stay in the present. And it, um, or I mean, and that isn't the case for everybody. But it's, um, I mean, that seemed to be like when I was taking history in high school. <laughs> that seemed to be like the general consensus of people. And yeah, sanitizing the. Um, the the rose tinted glasses go a long way in just sort of um in like the the sort of people thinking of the past especially the somewhat recent past as the good old days uh where if, if you call it the good old days then people tend to forget some of the less than good things that were happening in that that time and um and again, this is just what I've seen. This isn't the case for everybody. But uh, that my grandmother is uh, shorter than, like, her growth was kind of, I don't want to say stunted, but she's shorter than the average person because she was malnourished as a child because of the Great Depression. Um, and going, I mean... Uh, it, it not to bash on wartime rations, but going from very little food in the 1930s to slightly more, but still less than would have 
probably been like uh that then would have been better from someone who was coming from a background like my grandmother uh, that like she's a lot shorter than the uh, than other people her age and it's like it really kind of is like like oh yeah that that wasn't that long ago kind of um but I mean again just me so but yeah um yeah, so from the 1930s to the 1940s, uh, things went utilitarian. Um, uh, clothing was rationed, but also silk and rayon, or not rayon, um, but silk, which was one of the more popular fabrics to make clothes out of in the 1930s, was rationed uh, to be used in parachutes. Um, so rayon, which is like a, a synthetic, almost... A synthetic fabric that kind of looks a little like silk. Um, excuse me. Uh, that was uh, invented in the 1940s, and it really took off. Um, there are uh, there are instances of women who, uh, because nylon was also uh, nylon was also rationed, um, and so they couldn't have nylon stockings. Uh, so but they wanted to look like they had nylon stockings on. Um, so uh, at least this is the case in, uh, uh, there's a case of this in England, uh, a woman used gravy browning um, on her legs to make it look like she was wearing tights. Um, and it, she drew a, uh, a seam down the back of her leg with an eye pencil and uh, so, I mean, like, people wanted to, people wanted to have that sort of glamorous lifestyle, um, but they just, they couldn't, so they made do. Uh, and there's, um, yeah, people, people go a little nuts for fashion. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, and there are, um... I mean, I can't really compare the 1940s. Yeah, I can't really compare 1940s fashion to, or what the things people did in the 1940s to the things that people do now, uh, because it's just not the same sort of situation. But it, uh, people get really nuts. And actually, I uh, I have a 1940s dress as well, which I'm gonna quick grab. Oh my god, computer, what do you want? Yeah, I know I have to update the virus protection. Shut up. Uh, but yes, this is a 1940s dress. And this is the dress that I wore for um, uh, the Sonia video that I did uh, when, when Howard was stuck in the closet. Um, just going to move this over a little bit. Yeah, so this uh, three-quarter length sleeve, instead of the full length sleeve, um, and very, uh, very close fitting to the arm. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> I had a lot of fun doing that. Uh, the skirt itself is fairly, um, it's gathered along the side. So there's more volume right as it hits your hips um, or it hits my hips, uh, <laughs> but um, it's much less than the very Full, uh, full skirts of, well, uh, of other 1940s dresses, but also of the, um, it's, it's very different from the sort of slinky silhouette of the 1930s, um, or the, the fancy fashion of the 1930s. Uh, the, actually, actually, um, oh boy. This is a uh, project that I have going, uh, which I actually almost done with, but it is of a 1930s style dress. I don't think this is actually from the 1930s, but this is the, uh, the dress that I actually wore for the very first Sony video. Um, and this is uh, much more of a, it needs some work. Um, <laughs> 
needs a little bit more tender loving care. But I, uh, this is much more of um, a typical 1930s silhouette. It falls to just below my knees. It um, doesn't, yeah, just below the knee. And it's, uh, the pattern of it is, the polka dots are very sort of reminiscent of those feed sack dresses. Um, and, and I love it. Um, but it needs some work. I need to take in the sides a little. Uh, uh, but so that, in comparison to this, um, this has a section in the front which is, it doesn't, it isn't uh, gathered. It's very flat on the front and gathered on the sides and then flat again in the back. Um, also, there is a sort of, this weird sort of zipper in the back, uh, which I've only seen in 1940s dresses. Uh, they didn't do them in the 30s and they didn't do them in the 50s, <laughs> uh, which that must have been, um, I'm not entirely sure why they did it, but instead of uh perhaps instead of having a side seam the seam or uh, a side zipper under the arm they had it in the the middle of the back here thank you i i really appreciate that i've always loved the certain 1920s 1930s 1940s sort of time period and then i um <laughs> i just kind of ran with it <laughs> Back to the hat. Ugh. I, uh, huh, yeah, the, um, I love those dresses. I just love that whole time period. I used to be so, like, I used to be, like, genuinely obsessed with the 1940s when I was a kid. I was a weird kid, guys. <laughs> Although, in hindsight, it's really not surprising that I ended up the way I did. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we'll be in touch with that. Oh, man. Gosh. I've, I've been watching a lot of sort of sewing videos and things like that um, on uh, how to make hats, but also on how to make like historical, historically accurate costumes as well. Um, there is a particular YouTuber called Angela Clayton, who is excellent um she is really good yay thank you just got the email um and uh she makes um the 30s 40s dress uh, 50s dresses but also like she's made a, a renaissance inspired dress and like uh 19 or 19 um uh 1600 1700 sort of dresses and I have just been like, like one part, oh my gosh, that looks so good. And also like, well, she makes it look so easy. I wonder if I could do that. And I'm just, <laughs> this is how it starts, guys. <laughs> oh, yes. But. Uh, yeah, and then, um, so fabric was fashion in the 1940s, so they, uh, they had, um, different sort of design features that, ooh. yeah, that, oh man, you're giving me ideas. <laughs> Oh boy. Yeah, the um uh oh gosh, what was I gonna say? <laughs> exactly. And that's why I love doing these live streams because I it sort of allows me to get kind of rambly because I I tend to ramble very so easily. Uh but also, I, um, seven. 
I, uh, it just, it, I studied history in college. And I've had uh, a sort of a lifelong interest in history and especially of this time period. So I will take kind of pretty much any excuse <laughs> to talk about it. <laughs> and this has really been, um, this has been wonderful with uh, sort of allowing me to do that and, um, and giving me, oh, thank you. Oh, that's so sweet. Uh, it, it's just been, it's been a really great experience and you guys are so nice. And it's, I mean, it, every, like everybody that I've talked to uh, that has been um, part of this, uh, the Lovecraft sort of fandom, I guess, has been so nice and so sweet. And you guys are just great. I mean, I know that if there had been like, if I hadn't have gotten the response that I did with that, that first Sonia video, then it would have ended there. I would have just sort of gone, oh, well, you know, it, and I was, you know, I tried that, and I was, uh, okay, you know, I'm going to attribute to you, not much else. Okay, you know, that's that's what you do with a history degree. Okay, you know, sure, fine, you know. Um, but it's, it's been just fantastic. So just thanks is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Measuring the, uh, yay! <laughs> I'm measuring the uh, the front and back of the brim on the sides um, because uh, the hats of this time period tended to have um, a bit of an oval shape, and uh, I'm well. Sometimes I did, and sometimes I didn't. And <laughs> I'm trying to figure out which it is with <laughs> this one. Which is there. Oh, I'm gonna have to try to turn this over again. Okay. Mm. Although, in um, in a way, it's kind of good for me anyway that uh, that this hat has deteriorated deteriorated the way it did. Um, I did. I saw it in the theater, and I wow! I was really excited. And, and Death on the Nile is one of my favorites that that she ever wrote. So I really, really hope that it like that a it comes out soon, and b that it like it gets a better reception than Murder on the Orient Express did. <laughs> oh, I just love I love Agatha Christie so much. Um, but okay, all right, so. You see that that sort of tan strip on the hat there? That is uh, the lining, or not the lining, but that's um, what the hat is actually made out of. And it is either a fabric called buckram or uh, some kind of interfacing. Um, although I think it may be buckram. Um, I mean, if I remember incorrectly, interfacing is um, much more of a, uh, oh, oh man, actually, quick sidebar, talking about Shakespeare, there is a, um, there is a production of, uh, oh god, what is it, um, A Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, that is absolutely fantastic. Uh, that they did at, um, so they reconstructed the Globe Theatre in London, and they, oh yeah, it was, it was, so was, um, but they, uh, there's this production of, uh, of A Midsummer Night's Dream that is, uh, they filmed it when it was being performed at the Globe Theatre, and it's so good. Oh, it's so good. I had to shell out like six bucks for it um, because you can only get it online uh, through the, the Globe's website. But, oh, it's great. <sighs> well, little Shakespeare sidebar there. Uh, back to the hat. 
1936 was a wonderful year for fashion um, because it really sort of the early 1930s were um, <laughs> I suppose we'll find out uh, hopefully <laughs> uh, the um, the fashions of the early 30s and the late 30s uh, they weren't as different as say the, the early 40s and the late 40s um, but there, uh, there was much more of a sort of difference and, oh man, it was just gorgeous. Oh gosh. Oh, I, oh man. When I was, um, oh gosh, another sidebar. So when I was young, um, and probably 12 or 13, I read this book. It's called The Year Down Yonder um, by a guy called, uh, oh gosh, his name is either Richard or Robert Peck. Um, but he, uh, it's set in 1936. And it's the story of this girl who, um, she lived, she normally lives in Chicago with her parents. But because of the Great Depression, she's, uh, they can't afford to have her with them. So they send her down to live with her grandmother uh, further down state in Illinois. And it's absolutely great. Oh, I've seen that one. I saw that one in English class. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> we had, so we had to read Hamlet in English class. And we, um, my teacher got that, uh, that adaptation of it. And I about lost my goddamn mind when I saw that. Oh man, uh, Patrick Stewart is really good with Shakespearean things. Him and Ian McCallum too. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, although I've seen, so I have seen um, concepts for. I'm not sure whether they actually went through with it, but I've seen concepts for a version of Hamlet that is a um that's a, a D, D game gone wrong so like they're uh, the um the uh the the keeper is playing uh is sort of doing like um giving all the background information and also playing the ghost <laughs> oh gosh <laughs> Gosh, if that, oh man, I am very glad too, because if that, if that had happened, I would have probably curled up and died. I was such a big fan of the Lord of the Rings when I was in high school. Oh my god. Um, I have to quick grab a little box so I can support the broom when I, uh, I have to flip it over. And... Let's see. Let's Okay, got a couple of things to prop it up here. Um, oh gosh, what was I saying? I can't remember. It's all good. <laughs> all right, there's that. I'm uh, trying to measure the brim from the inside here um, to try to get a better idea of the. Uh, uh, how how long the brim is where it's curved, um, but I had to grab something to prop it up. What? Oh my gosh! <laughs> I mean, I used to uh, I used to take notes in circular Gallifreyan, so I can't talk. <laughs> hey, it's all good. Oh yeah, this is definitely this is definitely one of the um, oh uh, circular Gallifreyan is uh, the uh, it's from the newer seasons of Doctor Who, uh, but it's just this absolutely gorgeous sort of script um, that they've used, and it's oh man, there's a a guy online who's uh. Yeah, exactly. They uh, uh, there's a guy online who's made like uh, an an alphabet 
that is in circular Gallifreyan and is really cool. <laughs> it's really cool. And you, I think you can actually get it as a, um, as uh, uh, like a, a, a thing that you can type out what you want to say on your computer and it, it writes in circular Gallifreyan for you. I was never able to, to figure that out, but <laughs> I learned it on my own. I had, God, I had so much time to kill in, in high school. <laughs> yes, that is that is one of those episodes. <laughs> oh man. Gosh, there are people online who have like really um uh they've it just sort of done what is that? That's seven okay. Wow. Okay. Wow. This, this, this hat is four inches at the front and seven inches on the side. Oh my God. <laughs> wow. Um, oh. Favorite doctor, hands down, Tom Baker. Uh, he was the uh, the first doctor that I ever saw. Uh, one of the first episodes that I saw was, um, oh, the Ribos operation. Uh, uh, oh, oh, shucks. Should have made some uh, some lettuce bread. Oh yeah, Pertwee was great. Although I do, I do love that Pertwee did all of his own stunts. <laughs> He's like your badass grandpa. Uh, and Jody Whitaker looks fantastic. I'm really excited to to see how uh, how both. Um, both her and the the new writer are going to be. <sighs> My dad had um had taped all of the uh, pretty much all of the surviving episodes of Classic Doctor Who uh, when they were um, uh, when they were played as a rerun in uh, I believe the late 80s, early 90s, um, out of Chicago, and, <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, man, with his, <laughs> the, so, Pertwee's outfit is both very Edwardian and also very 1970s, and I love it, <laughs> the, the fluffy, the ruffles, oh, man, my, <laughs> I I found a picture of um of my dad from from the 1970s where I don't know what he was going to but he's wearing like a suit with one of those ruffle ruffle collar shirts and just like I found it and I started showing it to him I was like dad so what is this <laughs> ah, good times good times but yeah he um. Uh, they played uh, reruns. Of, oh, shit. Okay. Uh, they played reruns of classic Doctor Who um, from on a Chicago station, a uh, Chicago-based station, and um, which uh, my dad was just barely able to get the signal from, um, and he recorded all of the episodes that they aired right from the first episode straight through to the um uh the 96 movie with uh, paul gann um and they uh and he so i just kind of grew up with this box of tapes these vhs tapes um marked doctor who just sort of in the basement and um, when i got to be about eight or nine, I think I was, I asked my dad what they were, and he sort of went, well, do you want to, do you want to watch one of them? And I went, yeah. And it kind of went from there. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me. Tolkien was very much a scholar of all of that. Oh, yeah. Gosh, I love those. Just so much. So much. Uh, yeah. Um, oh, shoot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Tolkien was... Uh, such a scholar of the um of the, sort of that time period like the sort of um pseudo medieval uh i don't know what i'm trying to say but like that sort of a thing uh smaug is based off the dragon on, in beowulf i mean he um hit the uh and he uses runes in uh in the hobbit and lord of the rings and all of that and just Although, although I have to say, my favorite, my favorite little fact about um, about uh, Tolkien uh, and the Lord of the Rings is that uh, Tom Bombadil is supposed to be based off of um, oh Lewis Carroll, I think, and uh, because they were friends and they uh, they uh, I oh gosh. If, I, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, no, no, he wasn't Tom Bombadil. He was, um, he was one of the, uh, one of the Ents. Uh, he, it, Tolkien put in the Ents because, uh, Carol had said that they, um, uh, you couldn't have, uh, something about, um, it, it just wouldn't be practical to have uh, treat people in a story. Um, it, so you put him in and you made him one of them, uh, based one of the ends off of them, and it's fantastic, and I love it. And, oh gosh, we got another person. Hello. Um, so this is uh, kind of turned into a bit of a nerd fest. Um, hi, that's fair. It's not for everybody. Um, uh, but yeah, I, uh, I see we have three people here instead of two. So hello to the Hello to the third person. Um, I uh, I recently, uh, and by recently I mean yesterday, I tree beard. That was the one. Um, I got. I was. I had the very good fortune um, to uh, get my hands on an actually Edwardian hat um, at, from uh, Ren at Nostalgia Antiques and Collectibles here in Providence. And I am, um, uh, she let me borrow it for two weeks. And so I am just taking, uh, taking um, measurements and uh, later pictures uh, of this hat so that I can um, try to recreate it. And uh, because I, because I don't want to just like, uh, sit in silence and, and do my little measuring things. Um, we've just started to talk about kind of pretty much anything and uh, which has turned into uh, into Tolkien and all of that good stuff. So hello to the third person. Um, ooh, I'm actually gonna have to check that out. That sounds neat. Although talking about, um, oh, hey there. Uh, talking about, um, actually that's, that's actually really good timing, Jamie, um, because uh, talking about like excellent books, uh, six inches, okay. Um, you actually turned me on to this really amazing series, Jamie. Uh, uh, that starts out with a book called Johannes Cabal the Necromancer. Um, and there's about four or five books in the series, and they're fantastic. And they're sort of set in this um, uh, this time period that's it's sort of like an alternate history Earth uh, that is anywhere between um, between the uh, the late Victorian period and the the 1930s ish. Um, and it's just, it's really, really great. Uh, 
Uh, it's all right. I haven't read Pratchett either. Well, apart from Good Omens, um, the one that he did with Neil Gaiman. But oh yeah, yeah. So actually, Jamie, the uh, the short stories are in a compilation that you can get on Audible, um, which are fantastic. They're so good. Uh, there's uh, one of them. One of them is called uh, Johannes Cabal on the Blustery Day, and is really really good. And he, um, oh yeah, yeah, especially that last novel. Uh, there's a, oh, I can't remember what it's called. It's called The Long Spoon. That's what it's called. Um, but it it introduces the character of Zerenia, uh, who is this sort of um, half spider, half woman, uh, demon of the outer wastes sort of a character who is fantastic and uh, who I may or may not have based one of my D&D characters on. Because <laughs> she's, just, she's just amazing. God, I love her. Seven inches that way. And oh, cool, it's round. Seven inches round. Ah, <sighs> yeah. I'm going to flip this. Oh gosh, it's coming apart a little more. I know. I'm going to flip this hat over so I can show you, Jamie. Uh, it's got ostrich feather on the top. And I should probably put it down now because it's kind of coming apart. Um, it's uh, I'd, I'd put it anywhere between 1906 and 1912, 1913 ish. Um, but yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's it's gorgeous, um, but it's, and it's really kind of impressive that it's held up as well as it has, but it um, it's just too fragile to really wear. Um, so I uh, have been watching a probably in hindsight probably too many uh, <laughs> uh historical costuming sort of videos on youtube um and uh for uh this one particular series there's a um there's a lady who's doing a series of uh of videos on um making historical fashions from uh from patterns from the time period um, which, uh, I'm, I'm putting in the chat. She's fantastic. Um, but she has a couple tutorials on how she makes hats to go along with her outfits. And, uh, I, I saw that and I mean, she makes it look so easy. So I was like, well, I can do that. I, I can do that. And, um, I guess this will be kind of a uh, a test on whether I can actually do the thing. I think I can. I don't think it's going to be too hard, but... Oh, uh, yeah, I haven't... Hmm. Yeah, I'm going to... Um, Pratchett is definitely on my list of authors to... Uh, to try out and oh my gosh it's kind of <laughs> the heat has kind of spiked a little so I'm gonna quick open my window a little more. <laughs> and the door. I've got a crosswind going through here. Oh there we go. Oh that's nice. That's nice. Okay. But yeah, it um honestly if uh I, 
Oh man, I forgot what I was gonna say. Oh no, um, so I am kind of, I got interested in uh, both Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman through, um, yeah, there's a crosswind in here and it's all, uh, it's nice. You're probably gonna hear the tissue paper that, that the hat was wrapped up in all like wrestling around in the background. But at this point I'm too hot, I don't really care. <laughs> It's, I think it's like, it's 88, ah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it, um, well, so the novel that they did together, Good Omens, um, was made into a radio play back in uh, the winter of 2014. Um, oh man, that sounds so nice. <laughs> it, it was... It, we had about two days of decent weather, and then it's it's just like uh, it, it the it's spiked up again, and I'm just like, really, really. <laughs> I want it to be fall, <laughs> but yeah. Um, but so good omens is fantastic, and I highly, highly recommend it. Um, it's. Uh, a sort of, it's a take on the omen of the movie, The Omen, except if, uh, if the, um, if the, the, the baby swap at the beginning where they, they, the demons are supposed to stick the Antichrist in with the, um, with the, the big politicians, uh, if, yeah, Crowley, <laughs> uh, it's basically if they screwed up, if they screwed up. And the Antichrist ended up with a completely normal couple um, out in rural, rural England. And it's so good. But they're making it into a, um, actually circling back around to David Tennant, they're, uh, they're making it into a, an Amazon Prime series uh, that's supposed to come out next year, um, starring David Tennant and one of, uh, oh, I can't remember the other guy, but... Uh, David Tennant is going to be Crowley. I'm, I'm just, I'm just excited to see it on principle. It's going to be cool. Um, but yeah. <sighs> yeah. So, all right. I should probably have a list this thing on. Also, another good, another really good book. Oh, yeah. I keep getting the pronunciation mixed up with, um, uh, with Crowley from Supernatural. <laughs> uh, yeah, but another, another really good book is uh, The House with the Clock in Its Walls. Um, I can't remember who it's by now, uh, but it's fantastic. And there, like, there are a couple of books that I read when I was a kid uh, that have really like shaped me as a person. And that is one of them. It's fantastic. It's just, it's so good. And it's being made into a movie too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I uh, actually seeing the trailer of it because it's it's set in the nineteen forties, and I um, I didn't John Bolaris. Yes, yes. Oh my God, yes. Uh, I didn't realize that the book was set in the nineteen forties until I, um, until the trailer came out. Like, I remember, gosh, in hindsight, that makes sense why I liked it so much as a kid, because I love the 1940s. Um, still do, but it's, oh gosh, where is this one? Where did it come from? Oh, you came from the sketchbook, never mind. Um, Uh, yeah, it, there's, I read a couple of his books as a kid, and that one, and there's one with um, Mrs. Zimmerman and Rose Rita, uh, where they go down, I can't remember what it's called, but they go down to, like, 
I think Pennsylvania and there's all sorts of things about the hex signs that people put on barns there. And I'm just, <sighs> it was really, really good. Oh, I haven't read that. No. What's that one about? That sounds good. Gosh, now I think about it, there haven't been, uh, there haven't actually been a whole lot of like books that have really scared me. But the uh, the house with the clock in its walls really did it. <laughs> Got it. Come on, don't fly away now. Don't fly away. Okay. Had to uh, had to tack down the um, the tissue paper over there. Ooh. Oh, that sounds neat. Oh gosh, there's um. There's this series that I used to love called the Spider Rick Chronicles, uh, where they're mostly like like kind of a family friendly sort of take on uh, like general folklore. Um, it sort of has, uh, uh, I mean, it's it's like a family moves into a house uh, and has to deal with X supernatural thing. Um, yeah, it wasn't. It, I mean, it wasn't exactly like the books but then again it never is so like it was a, a pretty decent movie um should probably say i i, I mean i prefer the books but then again everyone prefers the books to the movie so make that what you will um i mean i like the dark tower movie so what can i say uh but there is a um they they deal with uh changelings in in the Spider Book Chronicles, where one of the main characters gets, ooh, ooh, oh, that sounds really good, yeah. Uh, but one of the main characters in the Spider Book Chronicles gets uh, replaced by a changeling, and that really like that that both like really piqued my interest and also it scared the crap out of me as a kid. <laughs> I'm just uh, finishing up my notes here on the hat. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So nice. It's coming apart. I'm, I'm going to put this back in its little bag. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Back in the tissue paper. Back from whence you came. Please don't fall apart. That's going to be, oh, uh, that seems like it would be really interesting. And back in the bag. He's going nicely. He's just going in the bag. Okay. 
Here we go. All right. Mission accomplished. Yes. All right. Uh, okay, I'll just put this over here. Oh, yeah, I've heard him. Yeah, John B. God, he was nuts, wasn't he? <laughs> or at least his work was. Oh man, I was, oh I remember what I was gonna do. I just got this um uh this book uh at a um, a secondhand store uh which I think may be cursed. Um one second here. It was ten dollars. It is in shockingly good condition, uh, considering that it was printed in 1915, and it's barely yellowed at all. Look at that. It's gorgeous. Ah, uh, yes. Good old John D. Uh, it's called The Lord of Misrule. And um, look at that illustration. Oh my gosh. But yes, uh, given how, how nice it is and the price, like it. It had to have been $10 for a reason. But it's in such good condition. And it's so old that, like, it, it should, it, it has to be cursed. That's the only, that's the only reason I can come up with, <laughs> with it, it being $10. But, oh, it's poetry. And it's actually really good. Um, so, yeah, it, uh, the author is Alfred Noyes, and yeah, <laughs> my dad is a librarian, so I get I get really excited about books. <laughs> also, actually, talking about books, I um. So there's a, a Lovecraft Arts and Sciences Council in downtown Providence um, that I've actually gotten a couple of really good um, sort of anthology books from. Uh, yeah, I mean, that that makes sense. But also, like, <laughs> uh, yeah. so I got a copy of She Walks in Shadows which uh, dear old PH has um, has done a uh, has done a review on, um, but also this one called Heroes of Red Hook, uh, which is really good, um, and it's all stories uh, where the protagonist is um, from a minority group, uh, and it's really good. It's really really good. Um, in both there are, uh, so She Walks in Shadows is, uh, from a Canadian press, um, and it was, uh, edited by, uh, Sylvia Moreno-Garcia, who did a, um, uh, an Ask Lovecraft After Dark episode, uh, but this one, this has so many really good ones, um, and it's, I think, uh, this is this was uh, published in 2016, so it's a little bit of a newer one, but it's really good, and I I really recommend it. Oh what? God, I'm jealous. Oh, that's cool. 
Man, I love all that, all that sort of stuff. It's just, I just think it's neat. <laughs> Oh my gosh, also, also. I can't believe I almost forgot when we're talking about books. Right. So I got this. <laughs> this book is a wild ride. Okay. This is <laughs> pulpy in the best sense. It's, um, oh man. So this is, uh, Gosh, how would I even describe it? So it's, um, I got it at the, uh, the Lovecraft Arts and Sciences Council, uh, the sort of setup of, of this book is, um, it's, so it's, uh, it, it's kind of historical fiction, I guess is the, uh, the best way to describe it. Um, it's set in 1925, um, when Lovecraft was still living in, uh, in New York City, um, uh, and it, <laughs> well, here, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna read the, the front cover of this, because it's really kind of almost indescribable. <laughs> uh, in these pages, H.P. Lovecraft lives again, and Sherlock Holmes, yes, that one, uh, stalks in New York in 1925, looking for a set of mysterious documents stolen by a New York gangster, Dan Martens. A visit with Harry Houdini, a seance with a beautiful medium, a trek through New York City, uh, New York sewer system and what lays beyond, make a fantastic tale, as told through the words of young Weird Tales writer Frank Belknap Long Jr., Lovecraft's best friend. So this... Ooh, I haven't read that one, no. I'm going to have to check it out. But this this story is a wild ride. It's it's told from the point of view of Frank Belknap Long. Uh, when and this was written when Frank Belknap Long was still alive. <laughs> uh, this is one of the uh, the last books that came out of the Arkham House Publishing, um, and. <laughs> It's just, oh yeah, I've read that one. That one's good. God, I love that. Actually, in the uh, in the vein of um, of somewhat of crafty and Neil Gaiman, uh, have has anybody read or heard uh, Shagatsu Peculiar? Because it's um, it's fantastic, and there are uh, there is. A series of videos on YouTube. Um, well, they're audio, really, but they're on YouTube of Neil Gaiman reading it, and it's oh, it's so good. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, yes. Well, yes. So, <sighs> oh yeah, yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah, it, it, it took me a little while to get it, but I did, and it's great, I have to say. It's really good. It's been a, a while now since I've read it, and I my memory is shit, but I, um, or at least my memory is kind of, it, it can be kind of terrible, so. <laughs> but I remember it's good. <laughs> I'm sorry. <sighs> yep. Oh gosh, what was I gonna say? I was gonna say something. I can't remember. Oh well. Well, I um oh yeah, yeah, so I Gosh, it, I just love Nyla the death and everything. It's 
he's such a versatile character. Like I, I love it. Like, I mean, I'm a sucker for a shapeshifter anyway. <coughs> Excuse me. But I just, there's just something about Nyarlathotep and the way that you used him. It's just, it's just great. <laughs> Actually, I um, I may uh, give it a quick once over again and post like an actual review of it on um, on this channel a little later because it's it's really good and yeah. But yeah, so I um, I've got the uh, the measurements I was going for. Um, and I, uh, uh, oh, on the, um, on this channel, uh, um, the YouTube, gosh, stop, stop messaging me about the, the Paul of the game, not now, please, um, <laughs> yeah, oh gosh, yeah, no, I've seen that, um, <laughs> <sighs> yeah, that is definitely the most bizarre. <laughs> huh. I mean, it's like, like you say, it's, it's both awesome and dumb. It's really great, but it's definitely not like traditional Lovecraftian. But then again, I mean, it, that doesn't make it bad, so... To each his own is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Right, so I, um, but yeah, I've gotten the, uh, the measurements that I was trying to get from the, um, from the hat, and I, uh, uh, yeah, so, oh, water and water. I don't think I've, um, I haven't actually heard of that. It sounds good, but I haven't actually heard of that one. But yeah, so I, uh, if basically what I'm trying to say is I've gotten everything I need, so I can, um, I mean, I don't have anything going on, so if you guys just want to, um, oh, oh, shit, that thing, it's been a long time since I've read the, uh, since I've read The Lord of the Rings, oh my god, I can't believe I forgot that. Oh. oh lord. Um honestly I'm not surprised that there's an Agatha Christie anime. Uh there's an anime of literally everything. But um what about the the watcher and the water? Oh um, it could be. It could be. I think I'd have to uh, to reread that particular book um, just so I can get a, uh, a so I can remember a little more about him. To be honest, because uh, it's been like oh gosh, how long has it been? It's been like probably seven, eight years since I've read those books. But I um, yeah, it sounds like something. Um, but yeah, so if you guys want to uh, stick around and um, and like just sort of talk and stuff, then I'm I'm cool with that. Um, but if uh, if you don't want to, then uh, I can. It, this has been going for about two hours, so I can cut it here. Um, it, I'm good with either. It's really up to you.
dresses that I was showing you guys earlier it, and sort of like you were talking earlier about how um, how fashion cycles back to things and I uh, have a couple dresses that uh, look older than they actually are so uh, yeah fuck it I'm gonna try them on <laughs> So uh, this is that one. I'm gonna uh, actually move this a little. So oh yeah, it's plugged in. Uh, all right. Gotta move my takeout. Hang on a sec. just be kind of, I can do like kind of a, this thing and hopefully it doesn't, be, hopefully it doesn't put me in too much of a shadow. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so this is, uh, this has a very 1920s silhouette to it. Um, the straps are very much um, with the 20s dresses that I have seen. Oh wow, that's really, that's really, okay, no, that's not good. Um, okay. Oh my God. Yeah, it's, uh, why are you like this? <laughs> Hang on a second. Here. Um, okay. Oh yeah. Use my ironing board as a table. <laughs> there we go. That's there. And then this can go over here. why I really like this dress is because it's so like um it's so breezy and it doesn't I mean it's very uh you aren't really um encumbered by it. I'm actually gonna uh, yep yeah, as you can see it like it goes all the way down to the ground um which that's really the only uh the only sort of drawback to it is that it, it drags on the ground um and it's starting to look really old <laughs> i mean it is kind of really old so hey what can you do uh but if this um to make it like actually look kind of more 1920s i would ah uh, shoot i need to uh, i need to tilt this down a little more but it's um uh I, this is my uh, knees, 
it would go down to about here. Uh, somewhere like that. Um, I don't know if that makes a whole lot of sense, but yeah, I mean, I um, I think I will probably have it at some point, try to give it, like, try to spruce it up a little bit, um, because this is, I got this back in 2014, 2015 ish, uh, so it's uh, it's getting up there in years. <laughs> Yeah, but that as a, as comparison, Yeah, so that as a comparison to this, uh, which is also very 1920s, it has the drop weights, um, which was very of the time period. And the only thing that really makes it sort of modern is that the arm holes go down. Uh, if it were having the arm holes be more up here, would make it more, um, more sort of not exactly authentically 1920s because it isn't 1920s, uh, but yeah, it um, and this does have that length again. Yeah, I love the color on this one. I I'm a sucker for olive green. What can I say? <laughs> So, but then those, as a comparison to this 1940s dress, um, where it's, uh, it has a collar, which was much um, in the uh, late 1930s and the, the 1940s, menswear sort of elements became very in. Uh, so having it, uh, having a collar on your dress, uh, wearing, um, uh, when women um, uh, uh, women started wearing jeans for the first time in the uh, late 1930s and early 1940s and 50s, um, uh, especially when they were in the factories doing all the war work and things like that, um, because these these dresses they just aren't practical for getting going out and getting sweaty and possibly dirty and you know any kinds of um it, separates are better is basically what i'm trying to say they're easier to just to maintain in general um although this you can sort of see this has uh the ruffles on the side which give it a fuller effect um yeah yeah the clinched in waist is very um it's very 1940s and the ruffles uh, or the, the these things on the side give it the illusion of being fuller while actually not using that much more fabric. Um, so they're, uh, and with the, uh, with the length on this, this is just below the knee. Um, so it's, 
the um, so the uh, the the last dress that I wore, the green nineteen twenties ish one, that was much more of a um, uh, a typical nineteen twenties hemline uh, flappers, um, like the most daring flappers wouldn't have uh, their dresses when they would have been above the knee, but not by much. Um, the, I'm gonna have to open that door again. Ah, damn it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I love, I love 1940s fashion. Just the 30s and 40s were really, really good. Um, <sighs> but yeah, the uh, the sort of stereotypical 1920s flapper dress um, that we see is really a product of the 60s. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. Uh, the um, uh, so there was a Bonnie and Clyde movie that came out in a, a, if I remember correctly, 1965. Um, that uh, made drop waist fashion, uh, drop waist dresses, and um, those sorts of things come back into fashion. 67, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's actually, it's actually not too bad. Um, and that uh, after that movie, people stopped wearing mini skirts. They loved that movie so much that they, uh, they wanted longer, um, uh longer dresses to sort of make to look like that but um yeah that was the one yeah <laughs> but the um before it really kind of uh people sort of i think anyway um people kind of associate oh yeah body and clyde with that movie instead of with the actual Bonnie and Clyde, and so they think that oh yeah, we know they're in the '60s, and and they um they, yeah, the movie came out in the '60s, uh but they they got the wardrobe like that was what they they would have actually worn, um but it isn't. It's a very '60s take on <laughs> of what they actually wore uh in the uh, late '20s or the '30s. So, um although there are some really great colorized photos of Bonnie and Clyde, um, which are fantastic. Uh, so there's a whole, um, there's a whole series of colorized photos that people have done that are really great. And I, um, I wish I had them up on a tab because I would link you to them, but I don't. <laughs> oh yeah, no, no, she was, uh, she was short, um, I mean, she kind of had like that uh, that 20, 1920s ideal body. She was short and kind of uh, stout, uh, well built, and um, she had dark, dark hair. Um, I think black hair. Uh, but hey, I mean, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we can um, 
we can compare that dress, which is very 1940s, to this one, which is very 1950s. And I need to take the waist in a bit. Um, I think I'd probably do it with this, uh, you can't really see, but this, um, this sort of outer section is sewn onto the side. Uh, so I'm probably going to uh, take it in a bit like that. Um, but it's, uh, oh God, yeah. I haven't actually seen Cabaret. Um, I've been meaning, it's one of those ones that I've been meaning to get to, but I just haven't gotten to it yet. Uh, uh, so this one is very 1950s. Um, this would most likely have a, uh, a petticoat or a crinoline underneath it, um, but it's, uh, you can see when it sort of twirls and it's a very, um, it's a circle skirt. <laughs> yeah, I love the color on this one. Uh, it should, it's a little too big for me. It should probably be more like this. Um, but hey, you know, it needs a little work. What can I say? Uh, actually, I can uh, gonna take the tag off it too while I'm at it. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, it kind of looks aquamarine on, or sort of teal on the, um, on camera, but in person it's much more of a, a bright sort of jade green almost. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I did just get it yesterday. I have, I have a whole pile of things that I need to, um, I need to make little minor alterations to, but <laughs> one of these days. Uh, yeah. And that reminds me, I got the, um, oh, hey, puppy. My roommate's dog was getting it. Um, come on, it's fun. It's really fun. My roommate has a dog, and she's a very good girl. Uh, uh, yeah, it um it does look kind of weird on camera, but I will hopefully be um be able to take a better photo of it than uh, than this lighting. <laughs> now I'm going to um I have uh, some dresses that are modern that were inspired by 1950s sort of things to sort of show that like. The more things change, the more things stay the same. And actually, actually, now that I think about it, I'm not going to wear those. I'm going to show you uh, this one that is based on uh, one of Betty Page's dresses uh, as in comparison to a modern one that is almost exactly the same. <laughs> What's that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hades is a, is a door and it's fantastic. I used to love Greek and just kind of every mythology when I was younger. Oh, it was so great. Okay. So there are 30,000 buttons on this one that I'm not going to do, but this is the Betty Page dress, um, which is, uh, this one would actually need to be taken out at the waist a little, 
Um, but I am not confident in my sewing abilities to do that, so I generally just put a belt over top and it, it works out fine. But short sleeve with this sort of little epaulette feature on here, the collar, um, circle skirt, uh, and pockets, which are surprisingly hard to find, even in vintage clothing. Uh, <laughs> gosh, yeah. Um, so there's that. And then that in comparison, oh gosh, all these buttons. Uh, Yeah, so the back, in comparison to this, which I think is meant to be worn open, but it's black and white, check dress, full circle skirt, uh, with, I don't know, this doesn't have the thing, but it's uh, short sleeve with pockets. Uh, there they are. So, I mean, and this, I got this uh, at a shop called Akira, which is based out of Chicago um, in uh, early 2016. So people in fashion keep coming back to things. And it's um, like certain fashions are classic for a reason. And this is... Uh, made out of flannel so i am just going to uh, okay but yeah so yeah really the only thing that doesn't uh really the only thing that doesn't tend to change a whole i mean like the only thing that doesn't, uh, oh shoot, I'm just reading, reading back through the comments and that's, oh, you are sweet. Um, but the, uh, the only thing that is, yeah, with fashion wise, that is very, um, unique to the time period are hats, really. Uh, you can tell where, um, <laughs> when a particular hat was made. Like that that Edwardian hat is very Edwardian. Like there's no mistaking that with a 1950s pillbox hat. I mean it's not it's just not gonna happen. Um or with this uh this particular hat is a 1940s sort of um truly which the feather uh the feather detail helps with that but also of this bright red, um, this bright red is very sort of uh, like patriotic colors were very in for that time period, um, and so there were a lot of like, I, uh, I shut, yeah. I'm actually, uh, um, I'm actually growing out my hair so I can uh, so I can put it back in those big Edwardian style buns of uh, the Gibson rolls. But I, because I used to be able to do that when I was in high school. My hair was down to about here, and uh, I still have a bit of a ways to go. <laughs> but I, um, I, uh, gosh, I just I was so sick of it by the time that uh, college got. Oh yeah. Yep. Uh, I remember seeing pictures of those in berets too. Um but yeah, it uh, by the time I, I got to go into college I was just so sick of having long hair that I um I uh we so my family had been watching a set of uh Buster Keaton short films. Um, and uh, one of Buster's co-stars, Sybil Seeley, had hair that kind of looked like mine, except it was in a uh, very short, sort of very 1920s bob. And so I, um, 
I had to float it by my parents because I, uh, I couldn't pay for a, a haircut by myself, but I, um, oh yeah, that's a shame. Uh, that sh it, there are people who make like historical reproduction clothing. And I really think that there could be a, um, a bit of a market for people who, uh, who make historical vintage looking hats um, to go with the clothing. But uh, as of right now, I don't think there is. And it's just, <sighs> yeah, there's, I mean, um, and like the, the rayon of the 1940s, the sort of formula that is, um, is how people make rayon has changed. Uh, so the, um, the, uh, it's made a little more cheaply now and it's not as, uh, the quality isn't the same. Um, uh, actually talking about hats, I have one that I don't think I have shown off yet, but I have four hat boxes and I, I have four hat boxes and they're all full and I, I may have a bit of a problem, uh, <laughs> but the, uh, the hat that I had done the live stream on last, uh, last time, this is how that one turned out. Um, no, oh, yeah. So this is meant to, um, this has much more of an Edwardian shape to it, uh, but it was just a black straw hat when I got it. Um, so I went down the street and uh, got these peacock feathers at a, uh, yeah, it, um, I ended up getting some, uh, some, um, Oh gosh, uh, some like insta dry glue, uh, and so it doesn't look the best on the inside, but you don't see the inside, so it's all good. Uh, and this little, uh, this little sort of beaded heart, uh, was in a box of oh, yeah, I am very nearsighted, so if you make any, uh, I'm going to give it like about a minute and a half and then because if you make any comments i can't read them now uh, but there's this um i have two now that are kind of edwardian inspired uh, so there's this one um and then uh, the other hat which i um the last time i did a hat live stream i was going to be working on and then i wasn't sure what to do with uh, and I found out something to do with it, so. Uh, I got a length of fur 
um, for trim. I put it around and then this is much more of a fall winter sort of hat. Um, but then I put this sort of little, um, this is one of two clip on pearl earrings <laughs> that I got um, for probably around three bucks. Uh, and then this sort of uh, sparkly rhinestone uh, was in a, um, a jar of buttons that I bought also from a uh, nostalgia and taste and collectibles. Um, different day, consistently nice. So uh, there's that. Uh, and I'm gonna put my glasses back on. <laughs> Ah, oh, shucks. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I have um, in the uh, in the trend of fur hats, I have this one, which I believe is uh, the nineteen fifties. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, um, yeah, I'm, so, here's the thing about fur. Uh, I, uh, I prefer faux fur, um, but if it's, uh, if it's already been done, then it's already been done, um, so uh, there's not a whole lot that I can do about that, especially when it comes to vintage hats like these. Like this hat, I believe, is from the 1950s, um, and it uh, was actually made in Providence, which is a neat little thing, I think. Um, this is uh, 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 Gladding's since 17, uh, what's it? 1766, so <laughs> I just think that's a fun little thing, but it goes on the back of your head like this. And uh, this is partly why I want to be able to put my hair back into a bun because this is not, um, I don't know how else this would stay on my head. It's not, uh, it's, there isn't a, an obvious place where you could put a hat pin. Um, and I think if I am able to put my hair into a sort of roll along the back of my head, then I can, um, yeah, late 50s, early 60s, I'd say. But it, uh, I think I'd be able to sort of prop this on the back and uh, and then it would be a little more secure, uh, but it, it very much is not right now. <laughs> um, and then this one is the one that got me started on, on hats, on old hats. I got this um, at... Uh, before I moved out to Providence, I got this at a uh, the farmer's market back in Indiana, uh, where I'm from, and I was just so fascinated by it because it's gorgeous. And I um, uh, this this one doesn't really work with the curls either. But if I um, if I'm able to sort of put it back in like a, a sort of ponytail, I know so. Uh, Rubber band, rubber band, there you go. Okay. If I'm able to put my hair back, then it, um, it's a tilt hat of the 1940s. Um, so it, I normally I'd like put my hair back with uh, bobby pins, but I'm, I'm not going anywhere, so I'm not doing that right now. But so there is a, uh, an elastic band that I have since replaced um, because it, it kind of disintegrated on me. Uh, but I sort of hooked this around the ponytail on the back of my head and I can um, I can do like this sort of and have it go off on like an angle that would not work otherwise. <laughs> and it's I really love it. I really, really think it's neat. And I, um, I saw this one. Uh, yeah, it could be. It's uh, it can be a little hard to date hats like this um, because tilt hats were very popular in the uh, in the nineteen forties, um, but they 
did also somewhat carry on into the 50s. So it's uh, a little hard, at least I've found. Um, but <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, possibly. Then this hat is one of my favorites. This is a very 1940s. Um, just going to. Ah, oh, shucks. I kind of like to tuck my hair under where I wear this one, but it's. I don't know how much of this you can see, um, but it's very sort of, it's very 1940s, sort of understated, uh, yet practical, and um, the, that was, I mean, understated but practical is very, uh, that, that that's kind of pretty much 1940s fashion to a T, uh, as opposed to the, um, the 1950s sort of, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. With so like this one with it just has like a black ribbon around the side here. Wait, am I? I was wearing it wrong. That was I had it oh man. I had it wrong. That's why it was looking weird. Okay. It yeah. I had it on backwards, that's why it wouldn't lay right. There we go. Yep. <laughs> that's the thing about these sort of understated hats. It's a little hard to tell which um, which side is supposed to be from the, the front or the back or whatever. Uh, but this, this little thing here is supposed to be toward the back. Oh, just how I figured it out. Um, <laughs> But yeah, um, so this um, this sort of has a similar shape to it uh, as this also, which I believe to be uh, 19, 1940s. Um, it looks a little better than it's actually on. <laughs> oh, this looks better when I don't have it. Puppy wants to get out. <laughs> there we are. Yeah, that's a little better. It, um, but with how it sort of slopes down from the front, it's a uh, very sort of 1940s. Um, I've seen these uh, these sorts of hats in. Uh, there's a oh gosh. I'm gonna start that over and actually finish the sentence this time. How's that sound? I uh, there is a YouTube channel that posts old sort of newsreel footage, um, and I've seen hats that look uh, like that in those um, in those things. Yeah, they're uh, they're really interesting. It I think is kind of fascinating, and also it it reminds me a little of. Um, uh, Marvel's Agent Carter. <laughs> oh, if I had a suit like that, oh man. <laughs> but hey, those are like 80 bucks online and there is quite frankly no no way that I'd be able to justify <laughs> spending 80 bucks. Oh god, me too. <sighs> I am so bitter about what they did with Agent Carter. <laughs> but Oh well. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Huh, yeah. I only had to shoehorn the love interest thing in season two and it just No. No. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. <sighs> but oh well. <laughs> but yeah, I mean it um it just kind of goes to show that there are still people who are interested in, um, or people who you wouldn't think would be interested in uh, these sort of 
not exactly period pieces, but like uh, you wouldn't think that there would be a show set in the 1940s um, that didn't star any superheroes from a, oh yeah, it's fantastic. And Haley Atwell is such a good actress. Um, but it just, it just stop at season one. Season two is terrible. And it's terrible. <sighs> and I had such a good thing going to season one. Um, but yeah. Yeah. <sighs> but yeah, I mean, it, it was really popular and they, um, uh, uh, there's, I mean, when I, uh, I started looking more into, uh, vintage fashion when I was, yeah, it, um, I haven't read those particular ones, but they sound interesting. Um, but yeah, it, uh, I started looking more into vintage fashion when I, um, when I started watching Agent Carter, and it's, it was like I'm not the only one. Um, so it's, uh, I mean, anything to kind of get, uh, get older things noticed a little more is, is good in my book. Uh, <laughs> That's a little better. Uh, but yeah, um, I was going somewhere with that and I can't remember now. So, shucks. Uh, I'm gonna uh, put these guys away. One sec. can't believe I almost forgot to show you guys. Uh, so I have, oh yeah, Caravan Palace is really good. There's also another um, another band called Odd Chap that does sort of similar music that, yeah. But so I, um, with uh, the last hat uh, live stream that I did, I fixed up this hat um, because it had a veil that was, uh, that was very um, uh, deteriorated over time. And so I got a new veil, uh, which I need to stitch in a little better. Um, but uh, this is a uh, 1920s, like, 1920s, early 1930s uh, 
I believe to be a sort of wedding hat, um, which I wore to the, uh, along with a, uh, an accompanying outfit, um, I wore to the uh, Lovecraft Film Festival. And uh, there, oh God, there was a guy whose name I can't remember now, and I'm really sorry, uh, who uh, recognized me from the live stream and came and said hi. Uh, so, um, he does the, uh, these little, um, sort of comics for the, uh, the conventions. Yeah, uh, oh, I'm going to mispronounce this and I apologize in advance, but, uh, Joe Kefensis, um, so if you're watching this sometime in the future, Joe, hello, thank you. Uh, it was, it was absolutely lovely meeting you and it was great having a chat um but yeah this is uh this is that hat that is i just love this i really really love this um and now uh if i wanted to have this be like super duper authentic i would put a big long uh sort of a not exactly a veil and not exactly, a, it was sort of mesh train down the back of this that would go probably down about here on my back um, or even further, uh, really dependent on the bride. Um, but that, uh, that may be something for another time. Uh, it may be a project for another time. Although, if I uh, if I wanted to be a uh, a ghost bride for Halloween, then I uh, I have my outfit already. Yeah, I um so when I when I wore that outfit down, I walked down um uh down to uh the arcade in Providence, uh which is a sort of group of shoppings that isn't like an arcade arcade. Uh although there is one of those in there too. But hey, you know, that wasn't the part I was going to. There is a uh, particular restaurant called Rogue Island, um, which if you're in the area, I highly recommend they're great. Um, but, and not too expensive too, which is always a plus, uh, but I, um, yeah, not a video arcade, it's, uh, it's sort of like an, a very early shopping mall. Oh, yeah, no, it's all good. Yeah. Actually, come to think of it, it's, uh, I should probably start thinking about lunch as well, but I, um, or whatever the, the brunch equivalent between lunch and dinner is. But, um, yeah, his, uh, uh, when I, um, I walked downtown wearing the outfit and I, uh, I think I spooked one of the, um, uh, litter. Yeah. Uh, I think I spooked somebody driving by because there was a guy who went by on a motorcycle and he did a double take <laughs> and it was hilarious and fantastic and I hope I didn't scare him too bad but also I kind of hope I did I don't know if that makes any sense but it was great <laughs> <sighs> yeah well it is kind of um kind of getting up there in the time so I uh I think I should probably grab something to eat um Wait. <laughs> huh. But yeah, I think I am going to uh, cut it off here. And um, thank you so much to uh, you guys for coming in. And where is that mouse? There you go.
Oh boy. Oh well. Um, but yeah, thank you so much to everybody again. You guys are fantastic. And um, uh, hopefully next time I do a live stream, I will give you a little more, uh, a little more notice than than an hour. Um, but hey, you know, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I want to. So I want to try anyway to um, to get into the habit of doing this weekly, uh, but. I am not sure how that's going to work out. So I uh, I know I'm definitely going to be uh, at least making videos, but hopefully live streaming um, as I'm making the hat. So there's that's definitely going to be a thing. Um, but yeah, so uh, uh, bye.